back. It's the 75th season for the Jacksonville Symphony. It's also the 10 year anniversary for music director and conductor Courtney Lewis. And I am here with Courtney Lewis. Congratulations. This is a big season coming up for you. Thank you. And we're really excited about it. Yeah. So much stuff going on. So a lot of anniversaries, but let's start with the 75th. What mm. do we know about what the symphony looked like back in the day? Well, originally it was a group of local amateurs um, put together. Um, they played in hotels and gradually over the years, things became more professionalized as more musicians were hired, as it became a full time job, as they hired music directors from other cities. Um, and during my time at the symphony, we've grown enormously. You know, we used to be 52 musicians full time. Now we're 60. Our budget has grown by over four million dollars in the last 10 years. Um, and I think our relevance to the community has also increased a lot. You know, we've diversified a lot of our offerings in terms of the kind of concerts that we present, but also in the kind of people that we try to represent on stage so that we can attract more people to our audience. No more playing in hotels. No more playing in hotels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and um, this is also your 10th anniversary, which I, it seems like time flies. It really has. It's gone so quickly, I can't believe it. Yeah, I moved to Jacksonville eight years ago, and I've done the job for 10. So next year is my 10th official year, but it's actually my 11th, uh, because I had a year as music director designate before that. Um, so it's it's been a wonderful decade. I mean, the orchestra has just gone from strength to strength. And, and so how, how have you decided to celebrate these these dueling anniversaries? Well, we've gone all out with programming. It's our most ambitious season so far. We open on September 21st with a special performance of Mahler's Second Symphony, The Resurrection. That features really starry soloists, Eileen Perez, the soprano, and Isabel Leonard, the mezzo. Um, the joint choruses of the Jacksonville Symphony, Jacksonville University, and the University of North Florida, plus the Jacksonville Symphony Chorus. So a massive group of singers. Mm. Um, and then the whole season, we've just, we've just upped the ante in every way in the programming. So the opening couple of weeks contain Mahler II on special, Richard Strauss's Heldenleben, um, Edward Elgar's Enigma variations, all on classical concerts. We have three commissions next season from Conrad Tao, Carlos Simon. We have an artist in residence. Um, we have great guest conductors, Bob Spano and Isaac Stern. The list goes on and on. And so we're going to um, listen to some Mahler in a bit when we get back. I'm going to have you kind of walk us through some of what we're listening for mm -hmm. um, and what people can expect to hear mm -hmm. when they attend. Um, but just briefly, if, if, if people are looking for something, you know, on the schedule that the, that the symphony has coming up, mm -hmm. is that just something that they find on the, on the website or is there a newsletter? Do you guys do any kind of distribution? We like do. That? If you go to jacksymphony.org, you can sign up for our newsletter, which tells you everything that's going on. But also if you go to the website, you can download a PDF of the season brochure, beautifully rebranded this season. We have a new logo, new typeface, everything's brand new, it looks beautiful. And that lists every performance that we have in specials, classical, films and music, pops, um, and they can see the entire listing right there. Okay, beautiful. Um, so how do you choose uh, the season lineup? How, is that something that's entirely up to you as music director? The classical concerts are very much for me to think about. I work with the team, with our artistic administrator and VP, um, Tony Nichol. There are lots of things to consider. We want to have a, a, a range of repertoire. We want to have particular guest artists. We know some people are available. We know some people aren't. There are budget considerations. Everything, every program I put together is run through a logarithm by a, by a, a PR company to see how well it might sell. So yes, the original ideas are often mine, but they go through lots of different groups of people. Um, Tony and Tori are head of marketing work on POPs programs and movies. Um, so it's a, it's a big group effort to put the whole thing together. And it happens years in advance. Next year is completely done. The year after, I'm, it's nearly finished. The year after that, we're already thinking about. Wow. Because classical artists book years ahead. And there are so many pieces that's come together to make a concert happen. Oh, that's extraordinary. Yeah. I had no idea that it required that level of advanced planning. Um, for the, the pops and the, and the kind of more pop culture-y elements that the symphony mm -hmm. offers, how important are those to kind of fostering a relationship with the community. Um, and I mean, I would guess that y your your love and your priority is sort of the classical side, but you make room for all of these other productions. Well, we do equal numbers of pops and classical shows. Some people prefer the pops. It's, it's, it doesn't really tend to cross over the audience between the two. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get somebody coming in for a pop show and then they trickle over to classical. They tend to be quite discreet. Um, but it's wonderful when you go to one of the movies and the hall is always sold out. And, you know, it's, for example, I went to Harry Potter a couple of years ago, and we have two Harry Potters, Deathly Hallows, parts one and two, in concert this coming season. Um, you know, people show up wearing the houses of Harry Potter, you know, the, the clothes and kids with their families. Um, there's a real electric 
atmosphere of excitement. And then, of course, hearing the orchestra play the score, you kind of forget the orchestra's there when you're watching it, and then all of a sudden you hear this music, and it, there's no speaker. It's right there in front of you live. It's very exciting. Um, so for people who haven't been there, you're watching the film with the, the dialogue, and then an orchestral piece or a music piece comes up, and so the orchestra is playing mm -hmm. along with the film. Exactly, yep. In yep. perfect time. Yes, and it's hard to do. The conductor has a really tough job. I used to do it when I was an assistant conductor, and I'm glad that I've been able to pass it off to my assistants here. You have all sorts of streaming banners in front of you on a screen when you're conducting that you have to line up. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of practice. Wow, that's extraordinary. Um, so what are you said that there's going to be two Harry Potters. What other film offerings are on deck this year? So we've got the two Harry Potters, as I mentioned. Um, we also have... Um, some Star Wars, A New Hope in Concert. And I think that's it, just those three. Okay. So one of the uh, performances, I think maybe one of the early ones, is Mahler's Symphony No. 2. Mm -hmm. You said that's the Resurrection Symphony. Correct, yeah. So I would want to listen to a little bit of that. Can you set it up for us? Let us know what we should be listening for. So the story of Mahler 2 is that a, a great person, a hero, is having a kind of struggle in life. And it's a very Beethovenian idea of darkness to light. The first movement is stormy. The second movement is a, a kind of dream of the past. It contains two songs with the mezzo and, and soprano singing. And then in the end, it's a piece about death being something that can be overcome and the soul is resurrected at the end in a very secular, non-religious way. Rise again, my soul, you will rise again. Um, and it's one of the most thrilling, optimistic ends to any symphony. Oh, let's hear a little bit of it. So this is uh, now like a 150-year-old? Uh, 1899. 1899, okay. Yeah. Um, but it was very popular at the time, very it, successful. It was. Um, one of Mahler's most successful symphonies in his own lifetime. It, he played it a lot himself. Um, he was a great conductor. He was the greatest conductor of the day, the head of the Vienna State Opera. And he was also a great missionary for his own music and conducted a lot all around the world. And of course, also, he was music director of the New York Philharmonic at the end of his life. And he performed it with them as well a lot. And so are you aiming to be a faithful interpreter? Are you trying to bring a new, you know, kind of light or, or sound to it when you're, when you're conducting? Well, I mean, as a conductor, yeah, you do interpret a piece. But I'm always trying to get as close to what I think the, the composer's intentions were. So you have the score. And in, a Mahler's score is often like a roadmap. There's so much information written in, so much extra information. Um, but you also read about him. You, you try to understand his life, where he was coming from. Um, and be as faithful to the score as you want. You know, a conductor shouldn't really be trying to stamp his or her own personality on a piece. I think that's a little disingenuous. You do, you do anyway. You can't help it. You can't help it be yourself. But the guiding principle has got to be getting as close to the composer's intentions as possible. So, uh, big things coming up this season. I know that there's going to be a lot of celebration, and I'm sure we'll have you back to talk more as we get into the season. But um, I hope you have a great break. Thank you. And uh, folks can go to the Symphony website if they want to get tickets or look at the... Up That's the right, jacksymphony.org. Please go there for tickets, nowhere else. Um, you buy your tickets there, you'll get the best seats. All right, Courtney Lewis, thanks so much for being here. Great to see you. My pleasure, Anne. Lovely to see you too.